Um, so, uh, next up is Michael Downey, and he's going, spoiler, it says on the wall, uh, talk about susp sustainability of open source in international development. It's, uh, I was told, it's a very specific, specific field, and I'm quite uh, interested in what he has to say. An applause for Michael. Well, thank you all for coming. I know this is uh, getting close to the end of a very, very busy weekend, and I appreciate you making time and, and keeping your energy level up, uh, as well as the volunteers who have been working really hard. Can we have a round of applause for all the volunteers who have been really hustling this weekend? Thank you. Um, raise your hand if you were in the community dev room yesterday. I know a lot of you here are interested in community management stuff. Great. Um, for those of you who were in there, you've heard a few talks that talked about how projects are maintained long term. This is going to extend on that and talk about uh, an area of interest uh, of how we're applying some of those ideas. Um, and get a, to get an idea of who is in the room, how many of you people in, in here are actively contributing to uh, free and open source software projects today? And keep your hands up if you're doing that. Uh, not just for a job, but because you really care about the project and it means a lot to you. Okay, I don't think one hand went down, that's great. Uh, now one last question, how many of you have other interests outside of free and open source software that you really care a lot about? Maybe you contribute money or time you volunteer for, raise your hands. As, as much or, many pe as, or more people, that's great. If you raise your hand at all for any of these questions, I think you're going to find these topics really interesting. And I challenge all of you to take what you're t we're talking about here today and consider how it applies to the own uh, projects and interests that you have. And, all right, this won't work, so we'll. Are we frozen? I think the screen is frozen, I apologize. We'll try it the manual way, okay. So it goes without saying for all of you here that open source software is a key part of our lives. Uh, I, normally when I give this talk and, and talk about these topics, I have to explain how pervasive free and open soft, source software is and how it really impacts all of our, all of our lives every day. And if those projects were to go away tomorrow, it would be really disruptive to us. But some of you may be surprised just how important free and so open source software is in other parts of the world, especially in low and middle income countries, uh, especially its capabilities to help people who really need it. Um, and I wanna give you a few examples. Um, first is in financials, what we call financial technology, financial services. You have people using open source software literally in 80% of the countries right now, every day, using open source software to conduct financial transactions. It may be uh, micro lending, it may be uh, getting market prices uh, in the open markets in their cities and villages, um, and ultimately help people trade and shop more fairly. In the healthcare area, um, open source is really, really huge. Um, it's used in everything from information management, managing patient records, helping people manage their diseases, their medication, um, really everything that is uh, involved in the healthcare systems and most of the, even the, the lowest of low income countries is using open source software today. And then finally, generally, uh, charities who are working in these countries, helping beneficiaries live better, more productive lives are using open source software because of its efficiency and cost effectiveness to make sure that their programs are running uh, at the optimum level. Hey, that worked. Um, just a quick order of business. Uh, we will take some questions at the end. I wanna give you some prompting questions as you, as you listen to the topics here today. Um, specifically, I want you to think of similar programs that you might have heard that address sustainability for open source. Either you've heard of them in the past, you've heard of things going on right now, um, and we'll talk about that. Um, we're gonna talk about services that we provide to projects. We're all about making projects better. I'd be interested to hear what you have to think uh, projects may need and that we're not offering. Uh, we're going to talk about funding models. Um, what funding models have you seen that work for open source software projects, um, if any? Sometimes people are really stuck on these ideas. And then finally, we're gonna talk about um, how we're working in partnership 
So if you can think of partners who may be able to provide financial resources and, and kind resources, we'll talk about that too today. Um, we've got a few goals to go through. First, um, my goal is for you all, is first to understand how open source uh, introduces risk in development. I put a little asterisk there because you're gonna hear a little bit different definition of development today. It's not just about programming, so stay tuned for that. Uh, second, I wanna talk about how um, the projects that are actively involved in these, in these areas of the world um, have specific wants and needs. Some may be similar to the projects that you know about and some may be unique. I'm gonna talk about our program and our goals for those projects and how that we can help make them more successful. And then finally, how we are working together as a group to build a team that will help uh, all of us be more, more productive and make more mature, uh, more high impact software projects. Um, finally, I wanna talk a little about how all of you can make a difference either in these types of projects or in your own projects. And that leads to the last one. Um, let's get some ideas of how you can take these ideas and apply them to your own work. So let's hop back to these scenarios for a moment. I wanna talk a little bit about what they depend on, um, some of the dependencies that you may not have thought about. Uh, when you have open source software in such critical roles, you really have to make sure, A, that the right tools are available to meet people's needs, um, that these tools are kind of continually improved and maintained um, as people uh, do better in their local economies, their local communities. We need to make sure that the people and the organizations that are using this software are getting the right training and support. These are people with very low digital, digital literacy levels. They're not used to using technology, and we need to make that experience as, as easy for them as possible. And then finally, and this is a really important one that raises a lot of ethical questions, we need to take care that resources aren't being wasted. A large majority of these projects are being funded either with public money through government organizations, they may be funded with charitable donations. And so as good stewards of those resources, we wanna make sure that um, we're not wasting efforts, duplicating efforts. Really good examples of, uh, of the push for this uh, are efforts like the FSFE's campaign for public, uh, public money, public code. Um, the US uh, Agency for International Development is pushing very, very hard for all of their technology-driven projects to use open source. So we're seeing a lot of good developments in this area, but there'll be more to come. Um, and the big challenge, and it's, we call it the elephant in the room, uh, is this increasing environment of reduced, reduced budgets, reduced resources for these projects. Um, the general feeling of austerity in what we call the global north, that's the highest income countries, um, has really started a chain reaction of budget tightening and shrinking resources, which means a lot of the funding and a lot of the resources that these projects have had are starting to shrink and collapse. And it introduces a real risk for all the people who depend on these software. Um, sustainability, uh, as we look at it, is really not just about the international development sector, but um, as many of you know, this is a conversation that's happening increasingly in FOSS projects. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So our mission is to react to this problem and really create an environment of what we call co-investment in shared resources. And what we mean by those terms are diversification of funding sources, getting access to different types of, of resources, either financial or human resources, um, and getting the people who have those resources to work more closely together and to coordinate better. A little bit about me and my background and why I'm here talking to you today. Um, I am not a public speaker by any means. I am an engineer by training. I've got two undergraduate degrees uh, in electrical engineering and computer engineering. I then switched my graduate studies into human computer interaction, how people use technology to get stuff done. And from there I went into uh, the corporate world. I worked in IT for, for quite a number of years um, in the healthcare field. Uh, went into financial services for a while. Uh, then did a pivot, went into this whole international development space, how people are using technology to make the world better. And for about 10 years, uh, I helped lead and launch a project called OpenMRS, which was an electronic medical record system uh, used in 100 plus countries now. Um, at the UN Foundation, my roles are really focused on uh, open source governance, participation, getting people engaged in these processes, um, get, building up a practice of community management and a knowledge, uh, knowledge and mind share throughout our organization, and helping people understand how to get better at contrib contributor inclusion. 
Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our organization. I'm not really here to kind of sell it to you, but I want to help you understand why we are really interested in these topics. Um, all of it really turns on this idea of what we call digital development. And I said development in this talk won't be about programming so much. Um, it's really a, a shorthand for what's uh, the official name in Wikipedia is called Information and Communication Technologies for Development, ICT for D. Um, this is a big, uh, a big phrase that really just focuses on technology that supports one or more specific missions and people and organizations that want to work, make the world a better place. Um, as you probably aren't surprised, as it's moved over the years, um, but being nonprofit, it's moved kind of at a lag um, as opposed to the, the traditional corporate world. But we've focused more and more on mobile applications just in the last couple of years, switched away from more classical IT systems. So, we are slowly catching up with the rest of the world, um, but it takes a little while. Um, we have a lot of different sectors that are kind of competing for interest and time in this field. Um, healthcare, financial services, as I mentioned, education, really anything that helps uh, communities become stronger. Um, and most importantly about this is this idea is evolving over time. And this is what's really exciting for people who care about open source. Um, not too long ago, only a few years ago, the people who are working on international development projects were really of a mindset where we're going to create a solution for the poor people, as they would like to say. Uh, we're going to, in some cases, literally fly in, drop it on the ground, set it up, and leave. Um, and this is very patronizing. People would call it neo-colonialism. Uh, there were really a lot of inherent sustainability problems in it. Um, that was kind of era one. Era two was um, kind of shifting people to be consumers, thinking about the people who are using these tools as consumers of the data and the software itself and trying to interact in some way. The really exciting era is the one that's just starting. And that's where we're looking at people as co-creators. Uh, so just as in, in our world, we have people creating content and you know, uh, building their own specific tools on cloud platforms or uh, uploading videos to YouTube and other platforms to share their knowledge with others. We're seeing the same things happen in the same trends in this space. So that long lag I talked about is, is shortening very quickly, which is exciting for us because as people who create software, we can help, sh help them turbocharge their communities in the same ways that we've seen here in Europe, in the US, et cetera. So two numbers here. Uh, 3.7 billion is the number of people who are connected today. It's only about half the planet. Um, we at the UN Foundation are really focused on taking care of the rest of that half, getting that up to 7.5 billion. And that's going to be very hard. <laughs> um, and to do that, as, as I say, we need to give people the tools that they need to create their vision of what we call the digital society in their own world. Uh, we don't want to presuppose that they will use technology in the same way that we may here in European countries, that we might do in the US, et cetera. We want to give them the, the, the raw materials to work with to make their own future. We understand now that people have different needs for technology, and we've got to stop presuming what people want to do. Um, classically, the, the thought of how to get here has been about getting people connected, getting people access to the internet, and let them use what we have, and, and that'll be good enough. Um, this has actually worked to some extent. Um, that access problem is largely solved. Uh, most people do have at least easy access to the internet, if not as easy as we do in our pockets or, or on the laptop when the Wi-Fi is working. Um, our organization, though, within the UN Foundation, we created this organization called the Digital Impact Alliance because we wanted to talk about something more, and we really wanted to talk about how people are using that technology and how people are adopting it. Um, this really hasn't been part of the conversation, and so we want to take those tools and make sure that they're actually useful for people. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a challenge. Um, it, hasn't been, it hasn't been working. Um, we've, we've tried to create a lot of technology out there, and innovation is great. Innovation is fun. I'm a geek. I love creating new stuff. Um, but there comes an intrinsic problem with that. And I'm not big on charts and graphs, but over seven years, uh, the team that started our organization put this study together before we all got together and realized that this is just in mobile healthcare applications. So not even healthcare applications, but just mobile-based ones. Uh, there were every year, there was 30% increase 
year after year over seven years of new platforms, new applications. So there was just huge proliferation happening. People were building new tools, people were building duplicate tools. Every single organization, um, every NGO, every government project that was out there was building yet another tool. And we realized that this has got to stop. We've got to stop reinventing the wheel every single time. We ought to focus on making stuff better, making stuff more useful. Um, but what does that success really look like? It's really hard to tell. And uh, we have to really move to a place where we're not looking at just the technology, but actually how people use it. And specifically, how that software is measured in terms of what we call maturity, how useful it is, uh, and most importantly, how many people it can serve, how many people it can reach, and what are they actually doing with it. So we're going to stop having to just measure how many new things we're creating and focus on the, and the why and the how. Here's a really painful example uh, that my colleague at Dial worked on. Uh, this is the country of Uganda in East Africa in 2012. Each of the, the red dots and each of the little names here are different technology projects that are happening in Africa, uh, in Rwanda specifically, in 2012. Um, by and large, they're all different software platforms. I won't have you read all of these, but um, this, is, this was a huge problem, and the government actually had to step in. And these, this was just healthcare, by the way, I should say. <laughs> just healthcare projects. Um, the government actually stepped in and called a moratorium. They said, everybody has to stop. Uh, we are the Ministry of Health, and we are halting all new technology projects in the healthcare system until we solve this problem, uh, because there are way too many. Um, most of these, has anyone heard of the elephant factor for software projects? A couple of you. An elephant factor is, uh, is basically how many organizations are contributing to your open source project, how many entities. Most of these projects here had an elephant factor of one. That means it was a single organization or a single individual in some cases contributing to these projects. That's a huge risk because that organization may go away tomorrow. They may run out of funding. And the people here, these are actual communities, actual states and regions in Uganda, um, were really stuck with this. And, and they don't have no way to kind of maintain that software and make sure that it's still useful for them. So this was, this was a huge problem. It wasn't just happening here. Uh, but it raises three really important questions that we should think about. Why are there so many open source tools solving the same types of problems? Why isn't there more collaboration and cooperation amongst both the projects and the organizations who are using them or developing them? And finally, how many scarce financial resources, how much money uh, is actually being wasted by this type of behavior? We don't have a really good handle on, on how much that is. We know it's really huge. Um, because it's hard to say what the opportunity cost is of having created so many problems. So one last time, let's look back at our three scenarios. Um, I want you to imagine all those red circles you saw on, on the map just now. And think about how many projects in this space, um, as I said, were, were maintained by a, a small group or a very uh, single individual. And think about um, when, that pro when that organization goes away, when they, go, uh, when they lose their funding. Uh, what happens to these communities? What happens to the people in the hospital clinic you see here on the right? What happens to the small business person uh, who can't get the, this odd bug on her phone fixed to find out the market prices the next day? Uh, what happens when the charity stops supporting the community health worker that's going around making sure people have access to their HIV medication? These are really, really serious problems. They're really huge risks. And if we are to be ethically minded open source developers, we need to start thinking about this. And that's where we step in, or we're trying to step in, um, and think about the harm that we're causing and what we can do to stop it. So our organization, as I mentioned, is called the Digital Impact Alliance. We're an initiative of the United Nations Foundation. You all know the United Nations. We're the nonprofit sector of that. Um, we were really created by a lot of these funders that I mentioned uh, calling a halt to the, the bad behavior that they've been taking. They set aside $75 million for us to help think about new experiments and new ideas of how to solve these problems. Now, open source is just one little area here. Oops, where'd it go? We're just one little part of our organization. But I think it's really important to understand what we do. Uh, we look at technology. We look at how people use data. Um, and actually make change. 
but more importantly is to understand what we're doing and what we're not doing. Our roles here are not about creating solutions or building technology. We're here to help the people who are doing that work. We're not here to fix things for them. We're here to help them be more effective and kind of turbocharge their work. So that's kind of true to the United Nations, if you think about it. We're about bringing people together and helping them be more successful. Um, so our role is to really focus on the ecosystem. It's to focus on the projects that are out there, how to get people more collaborative, how to get more people involved in building better software, better tools, better platforms for people. Um, and then the goal, ultimately, is to create something what we call an inclusive digital society. And again, that goes back to this idea where people around the world can use technology and make their world better, whatever that means to them, in their own ways, not the ways that we kind of hand to them on a silver platter. So if we're going to talk about sustaining these projects over the long term, um, we kind of did some early research and talked to people about what that might mean, mean to them. And what we found is like there really wasn't anything unique about our part of the world. These are actually ch questions and challenges probably many of you people have thought about in this room. Uh, maintain or burn burnout. Has anyone ever felt kind of overwhelmed and exhausted from maintaining your projects? Yes. <laughs> no one is here to take over. I'm kind of the last person standing. Yes, so this is common in our world, it's common in your world too. Uh, organizations have strategic shifts, right? Uh, if you are doing this as part of your work, I know a few of you raised your hands for that, or put your hands down when I asked that. Um, you, they may have a change of heart the next week. You may no longer have that, uh, those several hours a week to work on your open source project anymore. Maybe you have time in your, in your spare time to pick that up, but maybe you don't. Um, we could all use more resources. That may be more people, that could be money to get things done, could be more infrastructure, uh, more opportunities, more customers. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to reducing single points of failure. A lot of those are, are those of us who are burnt out project maintainers are often the single points of failure, but there may be other issues as well. There may be outdated dependencies, you name it. And finally, a balance of chasing shiny new things. Uh, for those of you who are working on projects, how many of you have a growing backlog of bugs that you kind of ignore because it's not very fun to take care of? I know many of us in our project are, guilt are guilty of that. So um, This is the shiny new thing scenario. And the good news is it's not just the geeks that have this problem. It's actually the people who want to chip in the funding to these projects. Um, these organizations want to build a great new feature set to serve more people, to maybe solve a new disease. Um, they don't want to you know, make the install time shorter. They don't want to uh, help reduce your backlog of bugs. They don't want to improve uh, your database performance. Um, and they're not willing to put up the money to do that. And so all of these things come into our idea of what sustainability means. So last June, uh, while we were kind of developing our program last year, there was a really great conference uh, in the middle of the year in San Francisco. Um, they had 100 project maintainers and what we called sustainers who were donors or other people interested in this topic. And I don't know, I saw Nadia here and uh, Xavier's here from Open Collective. They were awesome organizers. We spent the entire day brainstorming with these experts. And the URL is here, sustainoss.org. Um, please go read this report if this is interesting to you at all. Um, because they came up with really great recommendations here. And they're aligned very well with the list that I just looked at. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so while this was going on, and while we were working with a, with a group here in June, uh, we were also reaching out to projects in this space. Uh, as I said, there are hundreds, if not thousands of them, so we started to try to prioritize and have the same kind of conversations with them that we were having back here in, in June in San Francisco. And we ended up with 10 key findings. Um, these are kind of uh, distilled from those conversations that we had. Um, and these are in no particular order, by the way, but they are really the high-level needs of what the people who were running the projects told us that they really struggled with. And I can, we don't have to read these to you, but probably these look pretty familiar. Um, we would like you know, more mentorship. We'd like more high-level expertise. We'd like uh, experts that we don't, we don't have in our project. We'd like access to funding to do more, to pay people to work on those nagging issues, the, the dirty jobs. Uh, we'd like to be more interoperability, uh, interoperable with other projects. Um, we'd like to build a community of practice to train our contributors to get them more expertise and contributing more. 
Um, and this was the most interesting one to me is they like to share contributor pools. And this doesn't mean they want to go swimming, but it want, what it means is that they want to leverage people who are working in one project or maybe another project. People who have expertise about healthcare, perhaps. Uh, they may be working on a project over here, but that knowledge could be useful in another project. So we looked at all of these things and, and they seemed very, very broad to us. Um, but, and what we tried to do was take all of these things and mash it up against the idea of maturity. And if, those of you who are connected with either Apache or some other organizations, some fiscal sponsors, may have heard this idea of, of project maturity and there are certain factors, so things that you have done that kind of rates how mature your project is. And so we looked at a lot of models that, that help measure that and we tried to kind of create a hybrid. And what we did is we came up with, with really four key factors that ends up with this giant swirly thing with all the buzzwords, so be careful from this slide. Um, but I think it's really important and it really, buzzwords aside, it does kind of summarize what we're talking about here. Um, what we want at the end of the day is trust because trust leads to long-term sustainability. When you trust your fellow contributors, the other people on your team, when the people who are using your software trust that people will be around and be there to support them and maintain the software, what you do is you have this, this virtuous cycle here within this, this environment of trust where you have effective collaborative work that everyone's getting stuff done and feeling like they're productive, uh, balanced with fulfilled motivations. Whatever reason you're there working on this project, you feel like you're getting something out of it. You're, you're getting what you want out of the project and you're meeting the goals. Now to get to this happy place where we're, everyone's happy and cont continuing to be involved and the contributor base is growing and the project is thriving, uh, we did this synthesis and we came up with four key areas. And going from the bottom up here, this is a big slide but there's, and there's a lot to unpack. One of the most important things that we found was a need for a sustainable organizational home for a project. And what this means is having a neutral place where multiple organizations and individuals can come together and feel supported in their collaboration and know that their voice isn't going to get drowned out by someone else. Um, and you have to really deliberately manage that culture, we found, as well. You have to make sure that you have processes and standards in place for people to actually do this and to do it on a regular basis. Uh, the next most important thing, uh, the next two things, actually, are really focused on the software itself, not surprisingly. Um, what we call a robust technical architecture, really means that you have to have appropriate collaboration tools. And tools is in quotes here because in some cases it's actually literal tools. It may be things like good communication tools, like we're using mailing lists well and we're using forums or using chat tools and we're using uh, you know, good bug trackers and issue lists and we're using uh, good code review practices. Um, but it also actually may be collaboration tools as processes, how we interact with each other, codes of conduct, how, uh, you know, setting expectations about how we're actually collaborating. And the other side of that is actually what we call structured and unstructured content. This has to do with how your software is actually being used out in the world. Structured content is going to be stuff like having documentation here, who loves, who loves writing documentation? Not too many of us, some of us do, and we love you, thank you. Um, as well as unstructured content for your users. And that may be ways for them to get answers to their questions. It may be a support forum where people can go ask questions. It may be actually building up a community of your users to help them support each other. But all of those lead to a, an, what we call a technology architecture that is going to be there long term to support the project. Moving up our stack here, we get into what we call product development. This is about a long term vision or a strategy for what you're trying to build. Yes, it's fun to just tack on stuff and do things uh, as you know, what looks most fun from day to day. But this is really about listening to the people who are using your software, getting feedback from them, measuring that in a way that it's easy to understand and easy for your contributors to understand what the most important stuff to work on is. Um, and then behavior-based success measures. Um, for those of you who are, uh, maybe you've see, heard some other talks this week about community metrics uh, open source software metrics. This is really what that's about. It's seeing and measuring the outcome of your work. Um, how, how often are you doing releases? How quickly are you getting people to come into your community to contribute, uh, to actually write code, check it in, and how, how quickly is that actually getting released out into the world? So really focused on behaviors of people who are coming into your community, 
how they're contributing, and how the people who are using your software are getting their, their needs met as well, and understanding how that changes over time, because if you're making changes to any of these things, you want to see that you're doing better and not worse. And then finally, community effectiveness. Uh, this is the highest level, and this is about having an environment where you have a clear path for leadership. Uh, if you've ever been uh, a new contributor to a project, uh, sometimes you'll uh, maybe write a patch or you'll, you'll do a pull request and it may sit there for weeks or months or years in some cases. Um, having clear leadership helps you as a newcomer to understand how decisions get made, understand who the people who are involved in, and helps people see a path for them to stick around and be more involved in their, your project. Um, and governance and community processes is, is, is really closely related to that. It's about solving problems when they happen, making it clear to everyone how your community works. It sets an expectation of taking, taking this work seriously, and that's really the, one of the most important factors in these types of projects, because when an organization is looking to adopt this type of software, they wanna see that um, this is not a, what we call in the US, a fly-by-night organization. They wanna see that there's a real commitment by people to take this stuff seriously, because it's solving serious problems. So we've got all of these four areas that we're going to hopefully work on and maintain and build up over time. And we're going to lead to this happy swirly thing with all the buzzwords, and everyone's going to be happy, right? Um, the question is actually, how do we get there? Um, and I wanted to, to jump in here really quickly and, and say that there are a lot of views on this. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of different aspects to this types of, of challenges. There was a really great uh, session yesterday during the community dev room that I want to give a call out to, and I just added this in at the last minute. Uh, Vicky Brasseur, I don't know if she's in here, but uh, did a really great talk on uh, passing the baton. And for those of you who are feeling burnt out and feel like you would love to pass the baton onto the next generation, um, please go watch her talk. The link is there at the bottom. Um, she identifies these, these eight areas of why sustainability matters. Um, and if we understand that this really matters not, not only to our project and how it's used in the world, but to our own personal interaction with our project. We see that there's, there's work to be done. And it all focuses around cooperation. And so this is the obligatory definition slide. I think you all know what cooperation means. But I wanted to say a few words about it uh, as it relates to our work. Um, the, key, the key work that we uh, did in the last year was really understanding that all of these activities on those, those four big arrows I talked about, they really weren't full-time responsibilities for anyone in the projects. They're probably not responsibilities of anyone in your projects either. Um, and often it's rarely in someone's skill set. They may not be very good at it, or they may not like it, most importantly. Um, so we looked at what, was else, what else was out there in the world to kind of take care of some of these things. Um, your first thought may be, well, what about some of these umbrella organizations like the PSF or Apache or fiscal sponsors? Uh, like the Linux Foundation, do things like this, right? Well, few had kind of the right mix of offerings based on that list of 10, uh, 10 key findings that we found for the projects in our space. And so we looked at other models that did similar types of work in non-software areas. So we looked, like things, looked at things like artist cooperatives, uh, like art studios where people go to share resources, um, hacker spaces, maker spaces where people don't need to buy their own 3D printer, but will share one with other, with other hackers in, the, in their space. Um, and other types of these cooperative groups that are doing things together to, uh, to become more advanced, to do cooler work than they are doing right now. And so we started to build this model that is really based on shared goals, shared resources, but most importantly kept that autonomy. Uh, in many cases, uh, things like umbrella orgs, they take away your project's autonomy to become part of something bigger. And we heard very loud and clear from the projects in our space, at least, that they wanted to keep that autonomy. They wanted to keep making their own decisions for themselves. And so we came up with this mission statement um, that what we would try to build for our projects is an inclusive, open source, meta community for knowledge sharing, collaboration, and co-investment, which I talked about earlier. Uh, most importantly, we had to all be working for this positive social change I talked about. It had to be aligned with the same mission. Um, we would love to support other projects uh, like the awesome games or some uh, you know, machine learning stuff, but it's probably not aligned, at least for right now, with the work that we're doing. Uh, we wanted to work together to overcome these key barriers to building long-term, mature, impactful software that I mentioned. And then finally, build a public commons, a place where people could go, share information and knowledge with each other, and possibly, as I said earlier, even share contributors or other resources. 
so based on this, we came up with an idea of what types of, of services we might collectively offer each other and try to raise resources for. And it really falls into two key areas. Uh, financial support, which is like handing out money to get stuff done, which is sometimes the easiest way. Um, and then also what we call technical assistance. And I'm not gonna read all of the words here, um, but the, the key thing to know about our ideas about technical assistance is that from the resources that our program will try to raise, we're gonna look at two, two views on projects. We're gonna look at their life cycle, how early, early or late are they. If they're a brand new project, they're gonna have different challenges, different things that they'd like to focus on than a pro project that may has, have been sitting dormant for a while. Maybe it's been one person uh, kind of hacking alone. Um, or a long-term kind of stable project. Everyone's gonna have different stuff that they want to focus on. New projects are gonna focus on early things like what license should I use for this software? Uh, you know, I'm trying to get something started up. Uh, you know, how do I get people to, to collaborate and communicate with each other? Whereas on the other end, uh, when you're very mature, you're gonna look at things like how do I do testing better? How do I build a more reliable infrastructure? Um, how do I do continuous delivery? Um, if I'm gonna be managing money and donations, how do I, how do, I do that in an effective way? So this is kind of the, how we structure that conversation with the projects that we're working with. Another angle on it, if this doesn't seem to fit, uh, is what we focus in on, on uh, kind of need focused, what people are really struggling with. And these are different ways, it's, this, it's still the same types of topics, but we're just looking at a, a different view. Uh, people maybe really have a, a internal strife around money. Maybe someone's offered them a donation and they don't know where it should go. Uh, we'll help them understand that landscape of fiscal sponsors and uh, how to do donations and, and fiscal management. Product optimization, if you're not sure what the vision is for your project, what you really want to be focusing on feature-wise, there's another set of types of activities that we can work on. Um, contributor success, maybe you're struggling with building a vibrant community or, or maintaining your community over time. Um, different challenges will happen for different projects. And so our idea is to provide resources that may be consultants, they may be documentarians, if you don't have people doing documentation to help you learn how to do that more effectively, they may be designers, they may be uh, specific high level technical resources that can help you answer questions or, or think about you know, new stacks or, or, or new approaches to solving problems over time. So we, we got a few projects together. Um, uh, we're still growing very, very slowly. We're trying to actually learn as we're going here and not uh, get too excited. Uh, but I wanna tell you a little bit about them so you can get some ideas of the types of projects that we're working with and, uh, and how they are different from each other. Uh, humanitarian and Open Street Map team has actually spoken here at FOSDEM uh, a couple years ago, uh, did the closing keynote. Um, I think most people know Open Street Maps. Humanitarian and Open Street Maps team is both a community of practice, of getting people together to, to map the world around them in the, in the uh, low and middle, middle income countries particularly, uh, as well as a group that builds software to support that work. Um, so if you're gonna get a large group together to, to map a new village, they build tools to help those people go out and, and be effective volunteers and make sure that they're covering uh, the entire village, community, or region. BOMDI, uh, down below it, is a really cool idea in the healthcare space that has basically built a turnkey system for hospitals that manages patient records, manages uh, laboratory results and testing processes, as well as uh, an entire ERP system for managing uh, resources and funds and, and uh, personnel management within hospitals. Uh, all of this is brought into one user experience. So they're working with these upstream projects um, and building something that's really easy for people to use that have really low digital liter literacy and they don't have to become experts in those different projects. Sumsurizer is a, a very, very new project. Uh, it's a spinoff from an academic project actually at the University of California, Berkeley. And it is an IoT analytics platform that is specifically focused on how people use cook stoves and villages. So people who are going out, they don't have electricity or, or gas, they actually have to have their own uh, cook stoves. This is actually making sure that the environment for them is, is healthy and getting data uh, to the organizations that are helping deploy those cook stoves. Libra Health is a, a health IT community that builds uh, new innovative types of healthcare tools, um, web apps that are used in doctor's offices, clinics, uh, radiology labs, things like that. 
OpenLMIS uh, is started in the health space, but is now pivoting out into larger areas. It's a logistics management system. So it's a, again, kind of an enterprise-y web app to help organizations manage uh, the flow of products, goods, and people throughout their organization. And Open Data Kit is an Android-based client and server application um, that is really focused on uh, data collection and analytics of that data. And that can be used in a wide variety of, of charitable situations. Uh, to get this done, we're working with uh, lots of different partners because, as I said, we don't want to do it ourselves. We want to hook people up with the best resources that are out there. We're working with Software Freedom Conservancy for fiscal sponsorship uh, and business type related issues. The MIFOS Initiative and PATH are uh, working in the health space, I'm sorry, the finance space and the health space respectively, um, and are actually going to be leading working groups uh, for our projects to help them collaborate more closely together, find resources. Uh, we're also a sponsor of Outreachy. If you're not familiar with Outreachy, it's an amazing program uh, that uh, helps people get internships in, in open source who are coming from underrepresented groups around the world. As to how we're going to actually do the work, uh, we've adopted a very traditional open source style governance project. Um, we're not an open source project ourselves, but we believe in, in the work and the processes that you all have helped build over the years. Uh, we've got an independent governance advisory board. Um, that basically is in charge of distributing the resources that we get from our fiscal sponsor, which is the UN Foundation, as well as other funding partners that we might have. Um, most importantly here, you'll see that each project maintains their own independent leadership. This is not something that's going to replace how decisions are made. It's really to help them um, and to kind of escalate where people are struggling with technical problems or community problems. There's a working group there for people to come together uh, share best practices and help people solve challenging problems. Uh, we've also got these uh, sustainability groups that I mentioned in, in health, finance, et cetera, as well as technical interest groups when people want to talk about blockchain or whatever the exciting technology is that uh, people are excited about bringing into international development, um, as well as community working groups, people who want to focus on things like diversity and inclusion, for example. So wrapping up, um, let's go back to these top needs. What we think we've built is something that can at least uh, serve all of these needs that our projects have been, have been worried about. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but we think we have answers and strategies for each of these. Um, we've already begun to, to deliver some tactical assistance projects uh, and financial support grants we'll be doing every six months, um, rolling out small uh, grants of around twenty-five dollars to $50,000 for projects to do development work on these kind of neglected areas. And we've got an open governance plan. So we've got a way to iterate and learn uh, what's working well, what's not working well from these projects, and to make changes over time. So finally, uh, our needs, uh, some specific asks for all of you. Uh, one, do you know of any projects uh, that align with our mission that might benefit from something like this? We'd love to hear about that. Um, maybe some of you are connected with uh, organizations or, or companies that are interested in supporting this kind of work. We'd love to talk about that as well. That could be everything from financial support to in-kind infrastructure resources, other, other tools. Uh, some people like to donate employee time. Well, we need lots of experts to scale this up because scaling is hard. Um, so you may know people who would enjoy volunteering for some of these projects. They might be wanting to do paid consulting work. Um, we need more hackers. We need more documentation people. We need designers. We need project managers. Uh, basically, people that would like us to I'd like to help us build and run this program and like to help these projects be successful. So if any of these apply to any of you, please get in touch um, because we want to make this uh, widely understood and we want to test it out fully to make sure that this is something that might be, uh, might be useful in other areas as well because ultimately the problems of sustainability are ones that are very generalized to all of us. And I, I'll close with this, uh, this quote. Um, by Dorothy, Dorothy Day, who is a US-based uh, reporter from many years ago. Uh, no one has a right to sit down and feel hopeless, uh, especially those of us who are burnt out. Um, there's too much work to do. And the question is, how do we solve that? And that's what sustainability has to offer us. Um, here's our website, osc.dial.community, our email address if you're interested in learning more. Um, I really appreciate all of you thinking about this and thinking about how it relates to your own work, because as I said, this is a global problem. We're trying to solve it in our area, and we hope that other people will start thinking about this as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left for questions, if you have them.
Uh, just raise your hand and we will make sure the microphone goes to where you sit. Uh, we have a question here. Hey. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, do you have any advice for engineers or technical managers that are sort of more junior within NGOs that are looking to, so it seems like usually the problem is, is like the NGO will file a grant to solve a certain problem yeah. and they'll be like, we need this really cool flashy, you know, MVP to like show them, but really when you're doing your research and looking at technical solutions, you see there's something that might sort of fit the bill and might be better to contribute to those. And I feel like this is sort of touching on the problem you spoke on earlier. Yeah, so people in, in that role, um, one of the things that we want to try to do as part of this work is to become kind of a clearinghouse for projects that are hopefully of service to NGOs like that. Um, there's a really great pro uh, software project coming out of the chaos community, if anyone knows about that. Uh, it's called Prospector, and it's a way to understand what projects are, uh, are doing, what they're working on, how mature they are. Um, you know, is this something that we're, if you want to make some changes, are you going to get uh, your pull requests merged in a timely fashion or not? Uh, so we want to be able to provide those resources to the engineers. That's only part of the problem, right? Because you can come to your boss with a great idea, um, but they are going to say the funders are saying no. And so we're also going to work up the chain as well. Because we, are, we were funded by three of the largest funders, the, the Gates Foundation, the US Agency for International Development, and the Swedish uh, Development Agency, we're starting that conversation amongst the funders as well. And we're actually hiring someone to work with them on policy and business, uh, what we call business planning, to get them to start changing the nature of those conversations so they don't come to you with a predefined solution and let you do what you're good at. We have another question here. Hey, thanks for your talk. Was really good. Sure, um, thank you. So the example in Uganda, if I'm right, of the yeah. health. Yeah, so it's quite shocking actually to see that. Um, thanks for bringing that up. Um, I was wondering if we could, uh, or if you could answer maybe or talk about if we could like have the luxury that we could go back in time and Digital Impact Alliance is really strong. Yeah. Uh, and how to mitigate what was happening there? Or how would you imagine? Yeah. Uh, how, how we might do things better, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm a real big believer in failure, <laughs> first of all. I think, I think we do need to learn from our mistakes, um, and sometimes that's, that's really necessary. And I have a feeling that this is one of those times. Um, because innovation is something that people had to embrace. They had to first come to terms with the idea that uh, open source is a thing, first of all. They, they weren't just going to Microsoft or whoever to build some proprietary one-off solution. That would have been just as difficult. Um, but they wanted to, you know, to get that environment where people felt free to build their own solutions and they felt empowered to do so, I think was an important first step. So I may not have changed that. I, I wish it didn't get so, quite so big <laughs> and quite so broad. Um, but I think had we been there, we could start making people aware of what was already out there and helping them to understand the value of, um, of incremental improvements versus the, the not invented here problem. But there was really no one in that space at the time uh, that was even interested in having those conversations. Um, they were really one-on-one -on -one conversations and there wasn't a lot of clarity. Um, and it actually took the funders realizing that they were wasting their money to kind of wake up and, and put, hit the pause button. Um, fortunately, they had done that. So I think that this is probably a one-time thing and that uh, we will have learned from that lesson. So I'm hoping that this is a failure that was productive. Yeah, uh, thanks for introduction. Uh, you said that there are people who uh, attended Sustain o OSS session. Uh, could we connect uh, after the, the talk here? It would be interesting to like discuss uh, what were the outcomes who came uh, and... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so a couple things. Um, if you go to sustainoss.org, um, there's a really great report up there, a PDF of 30 pages or so. All of our findings and all of the notes and everything that we have, all of that raw material is available, first of all. Um, I don't think there was any kind of recording or anything. Um, but this is a topic I think we need to be talking about much more. Uh, I hope at next year's FOSDEM and other events we start having these conversations much more often. Um, I know Open Collective is here. Um, I don't know if Nadia from GitHub is here. Those conversations are still ongoing. Um, and there are communities you can join and, and have those conversations at throughout the year. Um, but go to sustainoss.org uh, to start with, and that will help guide you to some of those participants and, and understand who's actively working on that right now. Hi, Hi. over here. Um, I have a question whether you're trying to involve developers from the countries where these programs are used in 
development and sustain, uh, uh, sustaining the programs. Yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the many other areas of Dial that I didn't get into today um, is we're actually building a program and we just closed an RFP uh, to do a pilot program of a what we call capacity building. And our model for capacity building, again, this is a pilot, we're gonna test and see how it works, is to take uh, developers who are just out of university. Um, this is probably gonna happen somewhere in Africa, the country is to be determined still. People who are coming out of an African university, fresh college graduates, match them up with both an open source software project and an, what we call an implementation need. So this might be a government ministry who's trying to install one of these projects somewhere. And we're gonna match them up uh, for six to nine months, give them basically a paid internship, um, and give them, most importantly, senior level mentors, people who have been out in the field, uh, maybe they're from Europe or the US, other you know, senior, uh, essentially mentors to work with them on these, on these projects to get the software out into the field. And our hope is that that will put those graduates on the same level as someone coming out of the universities here in Europe who have that real hands-on work experience. So this is how we're hoping to build that up over time. Uh, I have to interrupt the Q&A. We run out of time. Thank you very much for the great talk. Thank you all. I'm pretty sure he's going to be, uh, uh, you're going to